Ready? One, two, one, two, three, four. <laughs> sharing his word, his love, because he is love. Ready? Nobody. <laughs> Quite. All the 
never get it right But it turns out they're the one you were looking for all this time Not just to nobody Trying to tell everybody All about somebody Who saved my soul
check. Wave to somebody across the room and tell them God loves them. Because that's why we here are here, because God loves us. That's what they were saying. Lift your face up to heaven. Look up at him. Quit looking at what's out here, because it's crazy out here. But look up. See what's going on up there. Lift up your face. Can you hear him calling?
above the horizon, new light is shining, salvation is on its way. Amen. I was lost, I was in chains, world had a hold of me, heart was a stone, I was covered in Just know Jesus loves you. And know you don't have to be perfect for him to love you. He loves you the way you are. God is good. 
All the time. <clears throat> well, before we get started, I have a praise report to uh, uh, tell you. Uh, after 25 years, uh, <clears throat> on Wednesday, we paid our mortgage off. So, uh, so finally, the house is ours, and uh, the insurance companies and the taxes. Uh, well, we're here to remember the things that Jesus has done for us. Remember that he died on the cross for us. All the blood that he shed was for us. His whole ministry was for us. Uh, we remember that the juice is his blood, the bread is his body. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for allowing us to partake of this. We want to thank you for giving us your son. And we say these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Ever. Time to rejoice. Time to give back to the Lord. The Lord loves a happy giver. The Lord knows what we can do and what we can't do. Uh, Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for allowing us to give back to you some of the many miracles that you have given to us. And we uh, say these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. To lay the troubles down, eating your soul. I know a place where mercy flows. Take the stains, make you wider than snow. Like a tide, it is rising up deep inside a current that moves and makes it come alive. Living water that brings a dead to life. Oh, ooh, we're going down. This was a present on my podium here this morning. There you go. Feliz Navidad, everybody. There you go. Isn't that cute? Thank you so much. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Well, thanks, thanks. We're getting ready to, we're starting a series today about Thanksgiving. Can you believe that? It's Thanksgiving is coming up. For the next two weeks, we're going to talk about Thanksgiving, and then, as much as uh, it, it's hard to say, it'll be Christmas. Yay. We'll be talking about it, right? We'll be working on Christmas services, and we'll have a series going up to that. Today, we're, we're focusing on something called getting thankful, getting thankful. Open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4, and then... Put a marker there because we're going get, to get to that, but we're going to look at some other passages first and some other things first. Well, this is the time when we get ready. Everything's getting ready. People are starting to think about turkeys and all of that stuff and all of the stuffing. And the, is it called stuffing or do I just call it that? Uh, uh, you know what I'm saying, that kind of thing. Uh, so the stuffing and the cranberries and all the food and all of that stuff. So everyone's thinking about that and thinking about what they're thankful for. And I don't know. I think this year, if you're in the world and you're walking around and you're looking at 2020, it'd be kind of hard to point out things that you're thankful for, right? I mean, if you look at the world, what's going on and and uh, people have even said, gee, Pastor Andy, I think, I think I'm even going to pass on Thanksgiving this year because, frankly, I don't have a lot to be thankful for. You know, it's, it's quite interesting to me as we begin to look at this. We have to understand that Thanksgiving is a, is a, a frame of mind. 
that it's something that we need to walk in not just one time a year, but throughout the year. We have the most amazing ability through Christ our Lord to be thankful. I mean, God wants us to be people who are thankful. He talks to us about it. He says it in the Bible, what he wants us to do. Look at, look at what it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Here's what it says. Rejoice always. Pray continuously. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You think about that, you go, okay, rejoice. Well, I, what, what do I have to rejoice about? Pray continually. Well, I can certainly do that because there's a lot to pray for. Give thanks in all circumstances. Does he really mean all circumstances? Or does he just mean the good ones? I mean, can I, Lord, do you really want me like when things are not going the way I want to, when there's a, a bad report from the doctor, when, when the, my finances are not what they used to be and, and things are hurting right now and businesses are closed and anything that you can match and whatever, whatever your thing is, Lord, you want me to give thanks in that? Yes. You see, when you look at that word for, for thanks, for giving thanks that they're talking about, in Greek, it means, uh, it's, it's really hard to explain, it means like to give thanks. It means like to be thankful. Be thankful in the things that you deal with in life. And we're going to talk about that today because we're talking today about getting thankful. Next week, we're going to be talking about how do we remain thankful, even past all the turkey and all of that stuff. Philippians 4.4 4 says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Philippians is this four little chapter book, four pages. It's just, it's real fast. It might be five pages if your Bible looks like mine because my print is about that big because I can't see that great, you know. But be thankful in that. Paul talks to us. He talks about this rejoicing, being thankful. He talks about this in this book. He uses the word 14 times. 14 times. That Look what he says in Philippians 1, verses 3 through 6. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I will always pray with joy because of your partnership with the gospel in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who begins a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. You see, if you need... Uh, if you're in need of some encouragement, this is the book to read, Philippians, because it's full of encouragement. Paul has a lot to say with us. He writes about this rejoicing and being thankful, being walking in thanksgiving. You have to understand, now when Paul is writing this, do you know where Paul, Paul is not writing this from a, a beach, He's not sitting out on a beach drinking a drink with a little umbrella in it. He's not doing anything like that. He's not uh, he'd just come off surfing. He's in prison. Paul is in prison. He's serving a four-year sentence for something he didn't even do, for, for, for doing nothing. He, and he's in there, and it's really kind of amusing, honestly, when you think about it. Here he is. He's chained to two guards. He's got guards on, and those guards were like lowered down from the ceiling, right? And they're chained to him for 12 hours a day. They have him captive. Now, what they don't realize is that Paul is the one who has them captive. Because do you know what Paul is doing for 12 hours? He's talking about Jesus. He's sharing the gospel. He's telling them about the Lord. He's, he's 
he, and these guys are standing there, and they're, they're probably like, they probably started off, is he going to do this all day? And then they did something that was unusual. They started listening. In fact, the Bible shows us how, how he led people to the Lord. I mean, this had to be an amazing interruption in, that, in the palace. Because now people in the palace are talking about Jesus. And it's probably not the place to do it, if you know what I'm saying. It wouldn't be very popular. I mean, it, here is this guy. And he's rejoicing. He's giving thanks. And he's chained up behind bars. Uh, look at what it says in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verses 23 through 28. And we're putting it up on the screen. Those of you who are watching, it'll be on the screen uh, in front of you right here. And, and here, here's what I want you to know. Today we're, we're looking at a lot of Bible verses because there's a point to this. This Thanksgiving is big. Here we go. Are they servants of Christ? Now, I... I are they servants of Christ? Let's get it. think about that. I am more, he says. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. He's having a bad day, right? I mean, this is not good. I, I spent a night and day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from the Gentiles. I've been in danger in the city and in danger in the country, in danger at the sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and I have toiled and I have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked besides everything else I face daily pressures of my concern for all of the church. Here is a guy, he, he, well, first of all, he's been in danger, right? He, he, in fact, what, what he should have just said, I'm in danger everywhere I go and whatever I do. Because that's what he's saying, right? I'm in danger at sea, I'm in danger on land, I'm in danger from the Jews, from the Gentiles, from people who pretend to be believers. I'm in danger. And I'm facing all of this stuff. He says, I've known what it meant to be naked. I've known what it meant to be hungry. I've had all of these things. And here's how he finishes. And not only that, but I worry about you guys. His concern is with the body of believers, with the church. What, what's up with that? Think about yourself a little bit, Paul. What's going on? Look at what's happening to you, and you're worried about us? So 2020 is here now, and we look at this, and Paul says, be thankful in every circumstance, and he can say that because he's been in every circumstance. He knows what it means to deal with these things. Let me ask yourself, let me ask you to ask yourself something this morning. Are you thankful? Do you find yourself thankful? If you're watching from home right now and you're sitting on the couch, and, and are, are you thankful? I mean truly thankful. I mean, do you, are you thankful to the point where you find yourself just breaking out and rejoicing the Lord in the middle of nowhere? Just, just I'm praising God. You see, can I tell you something, friends? It's easy for us to give lip service to thankfulness. Oh, yes, especially if you're talking to me, right? 
this. Oh, yes, Pastor Andy, I'm always thankful. I live a thankful life. I'm never not thankful. How's the job going? Oh, I hate that job. I hate that job. I hate those people. How's school going? Uh, you know, uh, school used to be bad. Now it's worse. Well, how's, how, uh, how are you feeling? Uh, I feel good most of the time, but my shoulder hurts a lot of times. And, and we start talking about that. And the, the, the point I'm making is people find themselves creating a list of things that they're maybe thankful for. But the things on the list are things that are just things. I, you know, I, I'm thankful for a refrigerator and the food in it. I mean, I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for my bed. We went to bed last night, and we woke up before the chickens, uh, before the rooster crowed, you know what I mean? Uh, 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 but I'm thankful for the bed. I'm thankful for my family. You ever say that, I'm thankful for my family? But then you always add on, most of the time, right? I'm thankful for my family most of the time when I don't want to knock them in the head. I'm thankful for a roof over my head. And the list goes on and on. You could think of things, but the question is, what if you don't have those things? What if you don't have those things at all? Right now, so you should know, if you live in this area right around here, there's a chance you can hear the service live on the radio by turning to 88.1. So you try it at your house, but you'll be able to hear the service. Don't try it at your house. Be here. But I mean, if you're, if you're not here, turn it on and see what it sounds like. You know, what do you say if your spouse is gone? What if you've been married for 67 years and your spouse is gone? I know this guy who, is, who um, I used to see probably almost every day. And he would come walking over to me and, and uh, him and his wife, the sweetest little couple. They were married 67 years. One day I saw him and, and I says, hey, how are you? Where, where's your wife? And he says, she, she left me for another man. And I'm like, after 67 years, she left you for another man? And he says, yes, but... He created her, so he just wanted her back. And I looked at him, and I started crying. Because here is a guy. Could you imagine that? I mean, Shirley and I have been married 47 years. 37 years. <laughs> we've been married 37 years. I was two years old when we got married. No, no, we've been married 37 years. And I think about that and I think, man, if, if something was to ever happen to her or happen to me, I think the other one would be devastated by that. And here's this guy, obviously upset about it, but he's praising the Lord because the one he loves just went ahead of him. And he's going to see him, see her again. You see, what, what happens if you lost your job? Do you praise the Lord anyway? Some of you might automatically. What happens if your health is being taken away from you? Friends, we have people in our church, people in our church family who are battling health issues. And uh, if you're watching today, you have to know that, that we are praying, praying, praying for you. And that the promises that God makes us that we're going to talk about in our next series are promises he makes to you. But God makes us promises. Well, what happens if a baby 
been born with cancer. Do you see what I'm saying? What happens? What do you do? What does God want from us when these devastating things happen in our lives? And he wants us to rejoice in the Lord. He wants us to be thankful, not that we're going through the things we go through, right? Because we're, we go through things sometimes and it's hard to be thankful for those things. But we have a God that walks with us and sees us through it. Even though we don't know how that's able to happen. I don't have to tell anybody who's listening today that life is hard. Because you may find yourself in a place today where you go, it's really hard. I'm dealing with things that I've never had to deal with before. And you're saying, Andy, you're saying, be thankful. Look, I know when we're dealing with situations, it's important for us to really get this. Because let me just tell you a little story. And many of you know this already. It was 1976. 1976. 17 years old. I found myself in the place where... Man, I was graduating from school, high school. First one in my family to do that. My dad, who was, who was very sick, uh, bought me a brand new car. A brand new Trans Am. Best car ever in the world. It's, I wish I had it right now, actually. But it was a beautiful black. Remember Smokey and the Bandit? I got my car before Smokey and the Bandit came out. And then the movie came out six months later. And uh, even though my wife is hearing this, the girls love that car. I mean, I was the cool guy playing baseball, having this car, and man, I was a, a good guy. And things were good, you know. Things were really good. I was just rejoicing and praising. And then uh, we got a message that my father had terminal cancer. He was my hero. And shortly after that, just before my graduation, a couple of months maybe before that, he passed away. He never got to see his only son who graduated from high school graduate. Well, let me tell you something. We had people from our church come over and tell me how God loved me and how there, that, that good is going to come out of this. On October 21st, 1976, at 8 p.m., my hero died. You see, even in tragedy, even in the trials that we face, even the challenges that you're dealing with now, nobody's expecting you, and God is not expecting you to go, hip, hip, hooray, because I'm battling this. But he wants you to rejoice because he wants you to know no matter what, you're not going to go through it alone, that he's going to see you through it, that he's going to walk you through it. Now, you may not feel you may not feel it, but that's where our faith comes in. I mean, have you ever felt like you were in the deep end of the swimming pool and there were weights around your ankles? That you didn't know where you were going to turn? How am I going to get out of this? If I could just hold on a little longer... Here's the truth, that in life that there's suffering and there's challenges that we face. And that's going to happen our whole lives, that there's going to be challenges, things that we have to deal with. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Isn't this uplifting? Here, listen, if Thanksgiving is something that pours out of a life that is doing well, 
If thanksgiving is something that comes out of the blessings we receive in life, uh, maybe, maybe for an instance, you're finding yourself in a place where you want to say, let's cancel Thanksgiving this year because I don't feel very thankful. And here's the deal. It can't be based on our circumstances. It's the first point in your notes. Thanksgiving is a condition of the mind and not of our circumstances. It's something that happens here. I mean, Paul is in a dungeon. He's rejoicing in the Lord. It wasn't based on his circumstances. He saw the big picture. He knew the rest of the story. And you see, the kingdom of God is the rest of the story. Listen to me. Friends, here, listen to this. If you and I are in the worst circumstances ever, and when we wake up tomorrow morning, we can say, I'm saved. saved. If you're saved today, that's all you need to live a life of thanksgiving. Because we have a promise, not only of eternal life, but that we have a God that walks with us, that gives us strength in our weakness. In those moments when we say, I don't know if I can take one more step, God says, come on, I'll help you. And he's going to see you through it. I promise you that. I can promise you that because I know who God is and I know how he works. Because we've all been in those I don't know if I can take one more step places and God says, come on. Look at what it says in Philippians 4.22. All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Now, remember I was saying people, guards were coming in. They were getting saved. Well, you know what they were doing? They were going back to Caesar's household, to the, to the palace, and they were talking to other people about Jesus, and they're getting saved. And he's saying, look, hey, there's a reason to be thankful. Look, I'm saved. Paul is saying this. Not only am I saved, but the guards are saved. And they're leading other people to Jesus. Praise the Lord. You see, if there's a reason to be here, if there's a reason to be in the situation that we're in, if there's a reason to be in the situation you find yourself right now, if God moves in a powerful way, and someone comes to know Jesus because of it. Praise the Lord. Amen? You see, friends, that's the deal. That's what we're talking about today. We're talking about this business of getting thankful. You see, uh, all God's people here send their greetings, especially those who are, being, who, who, who are belonging to Caesar's household. You see, maybe you and I have to reconcile what we allow to drive our thanksgiving in our lives. Maybe health and wealth are not the biggest indicator of what we need to be thankful for. Maybe we need to look at the bigger picture. Maybe the, the, it raises a question. How do you get your mind around thanksgiving? And the rest of our time today, I want to talk about five things. They're in your bulletins. If you're watching from home, take out your notebooks if you've been doing that and write these things down because these five reasons are reasons why we should be thankful because thanksgiving is not based on circumstances. It's not based on any of that. And in, if it was based on our circumstances, we would never be thankful. So here is the first one, A. We need to think, be thankful for God's grace. We need to be thankful for God's grace. I love God's grace, especially when I'm talking about myself. You see, do you know that we, we kind of are funny people? Um, well, I, I shouldn't say we. 
I'm a funny person. I'm a person who wants justice all the time. I think right is right, and we need justice. Uh, the only thing is, I don't think it should be about justice when I'm talking about myself. See, I deserve grace, right? I want grace for myself. I'm driving down the street, and it's, and it's uh, 25 miles an hour, like on some roads, and I'm talking about Robert Road or whatever, and you're driving down this road 25, and you're kind of going 32. And you're thinking, oh, Lord, I hope the police are not around. And then you slow down because your conscience gets the best of you, and Shirley says, slow down. And so I slow down, and now I'm driving down the road, and I'm going 25, and a car passes me. And do you know what I say? Where's the policeman when you need one? Look at this guy, the way he's driving. See, we want justice for the other guy, but we want grace for us. You see, here's the beauty. Here's why you and I need to be thankful for grace. Grace says you don't get what you deserve that you're not getting what you deserve. It's not about what you deserve to have. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, I have an idea. On judgment day, when we stand before God, don't ask for to get what you have coming to you. Don't do that. And if God, if God says to you, why should I let you in? Don't say, well, I went to church uh, on, on Sundays. Just say, because I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and he paid the price for my foolish sin. If you say that, God's going to say, come on in. Because that's what it's about, right? It's, it's not about anything else. It's about this business of grace. And uh, see, Jesus came to die for us. And the reason why that happens is not because we deserved it. Because what did it say in the Bible? I think it's in the Bible. When we were yet sinners... Wasn't that something about that in the Bible? I think it's in the Bible that he came for us, right? That he died for us when we were yet sinners. You see, friends, look, if you want to know something to be thankful for, God loves you, and he doesn't, he, 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 he doesn't want us to get what we deserve. He doesn't want to punish us. He doesn't want anyone to go to hell. God wants to give us grace. That is something we don't deserve. But you know, you might be watching today and we say God doesn't want us to go to hell. But do you know something, the, the, the honest truth, that there are people that will. Because they can't accept the truth. Jesus died on the cross for your sin and mine. If you receive him as your Lord and Savior, today at the end of our service, we're going to give you that opportunity. He will come into your life and change you forever. Listen to what it says in 1 Timothy 1.15. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. Who's saying that? You know who's saying that? Paul's saying that. It's in Timothy, right? He's saying, I'm the worst sinner of everybody. The Apostle Paul, look how God used him, and look at what he's saying. If the Apostle Paul was here, he'd say, yeah, but Andy, you don't understand. My job before I became a Christ follower was to kill Christians. I'm the worst. You guys think you're bad. I'm way worse than you. You see, 
if you want to be thankful, if you want to be a thankful person, a great place to start is to thank God for his grace, that in that truth, I don't get what I have coming to me. I get forgiveness. Here's the second thing, point B. I have everything I need. Do you know a majority of the people out in this world today, in the United States anyway, would say, I have everything I need. Now, did I say I have everything I want? I didn't say I have everything I want. Now, God wants to meet our needs. He wants to bless us. He wants to do those things. But God gives us everything that we need. I have to say, thankfully, praise the Lord, I've never had a day where we had no food or no place to stay. God always brought that, always delivered that. So here's the problem. Do you know, do you know why we have this problem with um, saying, I have everything I need? Because we want to compare. Do you know we want to play the compare game? Now, here's what you need to know about comparing. I don't know if you do this. But when I compare, I always compare myself to someone who's better off than I am. I'm never comparing against somebody who's worse off than I am. I don't know why that is, but when I'm, when I'm doing that, I'm going, man, you know, uh, I don't have a porch in front of my house. I mean, uh, I see some, I, there's beautiful cars out there. I don't have one of those. I have a nice car. But if I would have been, I, I'd be more thankful if I had a, a beautiful car. I mean, I, I don't have an old car I'm fixing up that's going to be beautiful in my garage. Now that I picked on almost everybody, I go around the, go around the roof. But here's the deal. I have everything I've ever needed. And the wants are kind of something, it's okay to have goals. It has. It's good to have those things. It's good to have these. And if you're watching from home, I, I, I'm not saying that you should feel bad about what you have. What I am saying is you shouldn't look at somebody else and say, I wish I had that. I, I could have that better than mine. You see, when we're doing that, we're funny people because we compare with someone that's maybe doing a little better in one way or another and whatever. And what we need to do today is we need to encourage each other to be so thankful. Man, I'm thankful for every person that's here today. I'm thankful for everybody who's watching from home today. Because here's what happens. Together, we have all that we need. We have each other. In those moments that you need encouragement, you're surrounded with encouragement. I heard, I heard about something happened this week that someone in our church family was hurting and someone came and helped. Wow. How encouraging that was. I'm thankful for you. And I won't mention names because I don't want people to feel funny. But when we do things like that, when we care for people, man, that's, a, that's, that's something to be thankful for. Philippians 4.19 says this, And my God will meet all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Amen. Point number C. I'm surrounded by love and sacrifice. Let me tell you something you might not know. People are not perfect. Did you know people were not perfect? I know that when I look in the mirror, people are not perfect. Because nobody's perfect. There was only one that was perfect. I mean, I look at our society and you know it's full of imperfect people. I listen to what people say and I think that just doesn't make sense to me. That's, that's not what God wants. And then sometimes what happens is the world tries to drive a wedge between us and others. 
Here's the truth. Despite imperfect people, we're surrounded by people who love one another. You see, we just focused on the imperfect people, but we need to act in love. We need to be examples. Well, I, I think I've read somewhere where we are Christ's hands and feet. That we are supposed to be Christ's light in the way we live and the way we act. It doesn't mean we don't fall short. Here, here's what I know. Yeah, over, over the years, I have people in my life that uh, I know somebody who, who uh, uh, builds houses for less fortunate people and he doesn't get paid for it. He just does it. He works with an organization and that's what they do. I mean, that's, that's love to me. That's someone who's loving others. I, I mean, uh, th there are people who write letters and do Bible studies with people who are in prison. These are people that I know. They don't get paid for it. There's nothing in it for them. Well, maybe there is. Because they're so thankful to be able to do it. There are people who sacrifice every day because of the love God has put on their hearts and they reach out to those who need encouragement and help in their lives. Friends, I, I don't know uh, if, if this makes any sense, but we are really surrounded by love. We are just have our attention brought to those who are not perfect right now. It's just around us. Here's the deal. In this earth, you're not surrounded by, say, say you're not surrounded by that type of family. Maybe your family is not a loving family. Maybe you just didn't grow up in that. It doesn't have to stay that way. It doesn't have to be that way. You see, there are natural families and there's church families. And I, I like to think that we have a loving church family. Families that care enough about one another that we try to encourage one another. You see, people often, often ask, where are you from? And you might say, well, I'm from Prescott Valley. But you know what? Even when I say where I'm from, I don't really say where I'm from. I say I'm from New York because that's where I grew up. That's where I was born and raised. But you know, that's not right. Because we're not from here. We're passing through. You see, we're going to be going home one day. You see, that is the message. That's the message for Thanksgiving. You see, people come in and they go, well, well, look at this place. I mean, they're meeting in a cafeteria. But it's not about the building. It's not about having an amazing facility. I talk to people on the phone and they want to know, well, what kind of youth program do you have? We, if your kids come, it'll be the first. You see, we don't have a big youth program yet. Uh, how big a congregation do you have? Uh, not big, but we're growing all the time. You know, we're getting bigger all the time. Here's what we know is that God has here who he sent here. You see, because of love, you're right where you're at. You're imperfect people who love God and love each other. That's what we are. We're imperfect people who love God and love each other. Uh, look at what it says in John 13, 33 through 35. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. 
you will look for me. And just as I told the Jews, I will tell you now. Where I'm going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, how many people? Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Friends, realize that you're surrounded with people who love, who sacrifice in their lives, even if they don't speak it out, who do things. And here's the fourth thing that you and I have to be thankful about. It, it, my life has a purpose, and so does yours. Our lives have purpose. There isn't one person who has been created who doesn't have a purpose. Everyone does. Maybe you might not know what it is today, but listen, God will reveal to you at the appropriate time. And it, it's a purpose, purpose that will lead into an eternal purpose. The Apostle Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. In 2 Corinthians 5.18-20, through 20, it says this, all this is from God, who reconciled us in himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciled the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against him. Boy, that sounds like grace. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. And therefore, Christ ambassadors, we are Christ ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us, I, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Jesus says, you see what I do? You do the same thing. That's what I want you to do. I want you to do this. You see, uh, my Bible says we're the hands and feet. Here's letter E. God is working all things together for the good. God works all things together for the good. You have to know that that's the way it is. Even though what you're dealing with right now may not seem like it. You see, what happens is sometimes, and I'm wrapping up, so I'll be done in five minutes, won't I? How much do I have? How much? Oh, five minutes, okay. We allow ourselves to think that we're not worthy. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. I can't do what I'm supposed to do because who's going to listen to me? I'm not worthy. What did we learn last week? That God uses the weak that he, he takes us just as we are and he uses us. Friends, if you're watching today and you're an alcoholic, let me tell you this, that your friend who is an alcoholic is more likely to listen to you about Christ than to listen to Pastor Andy, who they think never touched a drink in their life. And that's not the truth. I don't anymore for years and years and years. But the point is, God takes you right where you are and uses you because God works all things out for the good. Look at Romans 8, 28. You ever read this verse? And we know that all things God works for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. See, have you ever thought that your biggest sin or challenges you face in life could turn into your biggest ministry? It can. Here's the second thing. I have a reason to be thankful. I have a reason to be thankful, and it's point A. People who are thankful have five traits, and here's how we're wrapping. The first one is this. Uh, they're forever humble. They're humble. Ephesians 4.2. 
Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Look at James 4.10. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. 1 Peter 5.6. Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Thankful people are humble. And here's point B. Thankful people, uh, uh, a thankful heart is content. It's content. People are, are, are thankful, are happily content. You see, the things I once used to go after that I thought was going to bring joy to my life weren't the things. And if I was to make a list now, it'd be way different than what it used to look like. Look at what it says in Philippians 4, 12, and 13. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in, every and e in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Here's letter C. People who are thankful, trust. We have to trust. Psalms 34, 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Do you trust him today? If you do, you have a reason to be thankful. Here's point B. People who are thankful are driven to action. People who are thankful are driven to reach out and to share this with others. Here's the reason why I'm so thankful. Even though I'm going through all of these things, I know God is bigger than the things I'm going through. I know that at the end, he's going to work all things out for the good. It may not be the way I want it, but it's the best thing for me. It's the best thing for those who follow him. And so if you want to be sure to say that, make sure that you have Jesus in your life because that is the promise. Uh, point E, they rejoice at the success and the blessings of others. They rejoice when other people do well. I get phone calls all the time. Hey, do you know what happened to me? I paid my house off this week. Praise the Lord, right? Everybody in here went, woohoo! Isn't that exciting? That's an exciting thing. Can I tell you something? There's no more, the, the, there's nothing more freeing than to be debt free. If you're not there, trust me in this because you can be. And it's a matter of, listen, if you can do this, it's like a fresh air, a breath of fresh air, and you can change what it is you're doing. God will help you to do that. So, okay, great. So that's about getting thankful. So here's the, here's the question then. How do I remain thankful? How do I remain thankful? You come back next week because next week we're going to talk about remaining thankful. And we're going to go into this further. I hope, I hope you find yourself thankful today. I hope that at least you've had something to think about. I hope you find yourself in a place and go, well, maybe I'm letting my circumstances control my thanksgiving, and that's not where I need to be. Because even in my most difficult times, I guess I still have a lot to rejoice about and be thankful for. Maybe you're watching today, maybe you have never asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life. And we never want to leave a service without giving you that opportunity to ask Jesus to come into your life. So I want to invite you here, uh, everyone here, to pray with me. And if you're watching from home, pray out loud. Pray with me. If you'd like to ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life, uh, everyone just repeat after me in this prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. I repent of my sins. I accept you now as my personal Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Hey, if you need prayer this morning and you're here, I'm going to ask Shirley and Suzanne, if you would, if you guys would come up here and pray with people during this last song, and then we'll close our service. Thanks for being here. We're glad you joined us today.
Well, dear Lord, we're so thankful today. We come to you, Lord, with thankful hearts. We ask God that you would guide us, that you would direct us, that you would help us to stay focused on who you are. And even in the midst of the challenges we face, may we always know that you're walking with us. And for that, we have so much to be thankful for. So help us, Lord, this week to get thankful, to walk in your truth, to rejoice in who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thanks for being here.